Hey guys, Darren back again. We've got a Sega Mega Drive in front of us, a PAL console that runs at 50 hertz. Um, you might have seen and read on the internet the 50, 60 hertz switches and region free mods you can do to these. So we're gonna explain it, go through it, modify the console and put a switch here on the side. Okay, so the very first thing you need to do is fire it up and make sure it's all operational. So I won't bore you too much. It's got power, AV, a basic game, uh, and let's just fire it up. So that's booting. We've got the, got the Sega logo, and there it goes. So that should start Sonic. It does, and you notice uh, up here at the borders, the blue extra borders, top and bottom. Yeah, so that's in 50 hertz mode, and it basically sucks. So we're gonna get rid of that, and we're gonna run this at 60 hertz. Uh, even though it's a power console, I'll show you how to do it. So we just need to pull this thing apart, you know, take your game out. I like to fully unplug it all. Oh, it's a bit stiff, that controller. Um, that's a bit of isoprop there, the wet, you can see I was just spraying the slot in the game to keep it clean, so don't worry about that. Just six screws, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so I'll go ahead and just quickly pull those out and we'll lift the lid. Okay, so with the screws all out and just put aside, um, flip him back over and we can lift the lid forwards like that. Now just be a little bit careful because the LED is attached underneath with a simple wire. So first thing you need to do is disconnect that. So just bend the wires, like the pins of the LED, up sort of vertical, back into a sort of straight position, just with your fingers. And just take note that the red wire is on the left and the white wire is on the right before you take this off. Just so we remember how to put it back together. And then just slide the connector up the legs and it just slides right off like that. Then you're nice and free basically to put this lid aside and we're done. So put that aside, we'll give that a clean up a bit later. Now let's keep digging. So we've got to basically aim to pull this shield out. Let's just keep digging. So it's pretty obvious at this stage what you need to do, just all these screws that hold the shield down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, and leave these ones here on this heavy piece of heat shield. Leave them intact for now. So just let me pull these out and I'll be back in a sec. Okay, with those screws all out, uh, just go ahead and lift the shield and this little folded piece of aluminum down in here, just, you know, just with your finger or thumb, just bend that out the way and the shield will lift out. The Mega Drive, well, the Power Mega Drive is a pretty simple beast. Uh, this particular one is uh, M5 PAL. Um, and the jumpers we're looking at modifying are the ones over here. So I'll give you a quick zoom in on that. Right here. So they say JP1, JP2, JP3, JP4. So we'll go through those in a second and I'll, I'll tell you what they do and how we wire up our switch to control the region. So basically, you know, this is speed and region control in just these jumpers. Uh, the boards were sort of generic for PAL and NTSC, and when they were produced in the factory, these jumpers were the only real things that vary to control a few things, and the crystal speed, uh, which I won't get into that, and the color space of PAL versus the color space of NTSC. But we're focusing on this area today, Okay, so the very next thing we need to do is just do a quick voltage check um, and just, just check the pins, the voltage on each pin, and then we can determine how to wire this up. So I've just brought my multimeter in shot. I've plugged the power back in. Uh, there's no game. We don't need the game. Um, and I've got my switch here. So the one I'm going to use is a very simple uh, single throw, double pole switch. We don't even need the extra pins. We only need three of the pins. Um, so don't get too worried about which switch you pick up. Just pick up one that 
you know you like the look of physically i like the look of these ones i think they match the console style really well um, and i just picked these up from a local electronics shop so in a nutshell all we're doing uh, the center pin is always connected and regardless of which position you put this in we're either connecting the center to the outside or the center to this side so that's all this switch does and if you look over here on our board all we've got is a scenario where we need to connect five volts or ground to um, this left side of the stack so let me just walk through that now with you so you fully understand what's going on so first of all if you look at the jumpers jp1 2 3 and 4 jp1 and 2 both control the language selection so we're not going to mess with that today but you can see that the jumper 2 is actually bridged and so is jumper 3 so jumper 2 is bridged and what that's what that means is it's putting the console into english mode um, not japanese if we cut that bridge and we we control the voltage over here either five or ground um, we could control the language so that's as simple as it is basically and then down the bottom three and four control the pal or ntsc so jump jp3 is currently bridged to this pin uh, and four is not so that's forcing the console into pal mode and if we just turn it on and look at the voltages and see what's actually going on we can make more sense of this so if it's a bit confusing right now just hang on a second and i'll step you through it even more so just grab ground here off the ground plane that's completely fine and then with your red probe um, and your and your multimeter in shot uh, just gonna have to zoom you out a little bit on that right now you can see the screen so ground over here so jp1 is ground and that's not connected jp2 is 5 volts you know 4.98 that's 5 volts and that is connected it's coming across here so we can see that that's 5 so that's forcing the console into english um, this pin over here is also 5 so something i didn't mention is these two left pins are joined underneath the board and these two pins are joined underneath the board so we only need to solder just to one of the pads so right now we're getting five volts coming in on jp1 and 2 on this left side and that's forcing it into english if you wanted to put a switch in to control it to japanese we cut that link in the middle so it no longer gets the feed and we simply run a wire to one of these two pads doesn't matter and we and we feed it with a switch five volts or ground that's it it's just really that simple five five volts gives it english zero volts or ground makes it japanese and then on this bottom side uh, let's take a look so jp3 is ground jp4 oh sorry i'll do it over here jp3 is ground jp4 is five volts so three's bringing the ground over this side and that's forcing the console into 50 hertz pal mode which is this is a pal console so all we do today is we cut that bridge there stops the ground jumping across and we just feed either ground or five volts uh, into these pins and i'll show you how to do that in a second so if it's ground it's pal if it's five volts it's ntsc 60 hertz so these bridges um, are factory set so that bridge so two and th two and three bridged is a pal console two and four bridged would be a usa genesis so it's english 60 and this is so this is english 50 genesis would, would be english 60. Uh, a japanese console would have one bridged not two and it'd have four they have one and four bridged it'll be japanese 60. so you see what i mean it's that r simple really and i don't think there's a japanese in uh yeah there's not a japanese english option so you probably wouldn't run one and three bridged i'm not sure that would work but i'm not sure what mode that really is it's like a mode that doesn't exist you know japanese region in english so that's it that's in a nutshell that's how we control this uh the board revisions um do vary a little bit 
just take a take a Stanley knife or an X-Acto knife or something um, and just sever these traces. So down in here, just the top one is English. So I'm just gonna leave that in place today. But if you wanted to control your Japanese, you'd also cut JP2. But we're just gonna control 50, 60. So I'm just gonna cut through JP3. Just wiggle it back and forth until it cuts right down through the first layer. We want to make sure it's completely cut, and then uh, and then we can measure again. So um, so now there's a five volt jump across those two. So we're getting uh, voltage on one, not the other. So that's broken. So our next stage is to grab some wires and wire up our switch, uh, and ultimately feed the wires to the pins. So I just like to use some of this. Uh, very fine wrapping wire. Um, it's really fine. This one comes in multi-colors. Uh, so today we're just going to use three wires, red for five volts, black for ground, and yellow uh, for the, tr the signal trigger wire. If you wanted to run English Japanese switch as well, you'd need a switch that had another position, and or two switches would be better actually. Two of these would be fine, side by side. And you run another feed across to the, the language selection. But we're just going to do the 50 60 today. So uh, I've already cut the yellow off. I'm just going to cut some red off. Just basically measure it out and cut them to length. We're going to run them right across the board from the switch to the pins. Now I know we could be taking 5 volts from the regulator, just a nice short path, and also ground from local here. A nice short path but to keep things really simple and not introduce any more solder points in the board I'm just going to keep all the attention over here today on these pins because they've got everything we need and we'll just run three wires in total across to our switch okay so you've got your three wires now um, and all you need to do is prepare them by stripping the ends off just like that and expose the center core. So these really fine wires are just single core. There's no multi strands of wire. So they're really easy to work with. And to strip them, um, it's just a matter of using your side cutters, uh, put them facing inwards like this. So the flat edges to the outside, just put, just, you know, pick your sort of distance. Um, there you go. You can see that. Just very gently squeeze and pull off the end and the casing will just come right off. You don't need uh, wire strippers for this stuff because it's just so fine. Like I cut the whole end off that time. I squeezed a little bit hard, so just take a little bit more and very gently just pull it off. And there it is. So that's how you strip the wires. Um, they're so fine, we don't really need to tin them. We'll just make sure they get good solder penetration when we solder it on. But that's it. We're going to need to solder our wires to our switch. So I've just got this little alligator holder. Just sit it up here on the heat shield. So it doesn't matter which way we solder the wires, as long as we get um, red five volts on one side, black on the other, and yellow in the middle. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. So just before you solder onto these pins here, I think it's wise to put a little bit of flux on the pins. Uh, and actually just basically just squeeze it onto the pins onto the top. Just put a bit of flux onto those pins and it'll help the solder penetrate in uh, with less heat. So just touch, heat it up at fra fraction, add some solder and lift off. Might crackle and pop a little bit, but that's just the, the flux sort of burning off. And that's all we really need, just a little bit of solder like that on the three pins. The bottom three we don't need today, but you could control other parts of the circuit if you wanted to, like an LED or something. Um, so just remember that, like in 60, we're gonna have, a, we're gonna have ground and uh, five volts available to us in that position. So we could use the bottom two pins and run a wire out to the LED 
uh, and override the color space of that, have a green and red LED or something, but I'm not gonna do that in this case. So let's just move on. Okay, so with those wires uh, soldered up, I like to then just give the whole thing a bit of a twist just to keep the three strands all together all the way along just twist the whole lot up ah, don't drop it like that okay then you end up with something like this which is kind of one wire, all nicely twisted. They're not going to do anything. They're all fine at that end. There's no shorting going to happen. Then you've just got one sort of wire to route across the board. And like I said at the start of the video, in the ideal world, I'd run ground and five volts up here to this end of the board and just run the one wire. But it's not really a big deal. So, you know, you can run it underneath or through the legs of components and things if you want to keep it tidy on the board. But... The main thing is to avoid using hot glue to hold this down. It's not really the tidiest way to do this job. Um, and I don't really like it. So we're just going to go underneath the leg of that component. Or between the legs, I should say. And just feed it through like that. Our ultimate position is going to be under there, under that red wire. And we're going to come in onto these pads here. Um, now our, our, the, our heat RF tray is gonna connect uh, back in here like this. So just make sure you run out this sort of gap over here and that won't be a problem. Okay, so looking at the board, we need to take a five volt feed, a ground feed and our signal wires. So looking at the board, you can see that this this is the ground plane and it extends into this large piece of green, uh, let's just call it a trace here. And that goes up to JP1. So that's a really solid ground point to take. Five volts is going to be this inside trace here. It feeds into both JP2 and JP4. So let's just take it off JP4 because um, they're nice and far apart. We're not gonna get them, we're not gonna to touch. And then of course, we're gonna control the JP3 sort of four position. Now remember that these two pins are actually joined together underneath the board. So we only have to pick one of them or both, it doesn't matter. Um, you could put a big blob of solder right across the two, but I'm just gonna pick this bottom pin here because it's already got a nice piece of solder on it to, to attach to. So let's just tin these up, make sure our console is in the off position. Um, take this one, just put a bit of solder on that. Take that one and take that one. Right, so there's our solder points. And then we basically just put our wires in place. So just make sure you're still nicely twisted up. So our ground is, our ground's going first. I'm just gonna, just gonna strip that wire. The five volts goes next. And our signal wire the back there. So I think you can see all that. Um, try and get your solder joints nice and shiny. So that one and that one were nice and shiny. This one's a little bit dull, so I might put a little bit of solder back on that, but generally they're okay, like just like that. But yeah, just watch them if they go a little bit dull, it sort of signifies a bit of a cold join. So when soldering in general, always aim for a nice shiny result. That's pretty much a nice strong solid connection like an electrical connection 
Okay, so now we're pretty much done. That is 50, 60 hertz done. It's just that easy. Um, now we could test this, but remember with composite video output, uh, our color spectrum is gonna be all over the place and we're probably gonna get a black and white signal, if a signal at all. It's because the PAL crystal oscillator uh, is a specific frequency for PAL color TV and the NTC crystal is a specific frequency for NTSC uh, USA TV. So we're forcing this into 60 hertz, but we're using the original crystal. So um, it, it won't work properly via composite video unless we introduce a new crystal uh, and reset that frequency. But to be honest, that's a lot, it's a, bit, well, it's a bit more work. And to be honest, I'm not a big fan of that when these consoles output a really high quality RGB signal straight out of the rear connector. So if you run an RGB SCART cable out to your TV or to an upscaler, such as the FrameMaster, then the RGB signal is unaffected by 5060 and the crystals whatsoever. It'll always just work. So I'd recommend you just do that. Um, but you know, let's give it a quick test. So let me just get this cable back up quickly. I'll keep the camera running, plug it back in, plug in our PAL game. I'll flick my screen over to, um, to composite and let's turn it on and see what happens. Uh, so what are we set to? Our switch is in the, it's actually in the 50 position. So let's leave it in that. Okay, so we're booting up. And nothing's really changed. We're still at 50 hertz. Everything's fine. Okay, so let's flick the switch. We'll do it live. And the color will go really wobbly, probably into black and white. Let's just let the game start. Listen to the music as well. You can hear the music speed. Flicked it across. So there you go. So there, we're in 60 now. That the music sped right up and the color spectrum's gone really wobbly because our crystal frequency is incorrect. I'll go back to 50 for a second. So the colors come back, but, and our music slowed right down. Let's go one more time. Music's up and our color space is wrong. So everything's actually operating perfectly. I'll just now switch that off. I'll grab an RGB SCART cable. I'll quickly move this over to the other TV that accepts SCART and I'll make sure the RGB color space is correct. And then uh, we're pretty much done. We can mount the switch and we're off and running. So if you want to see me modify a console like this further and do the crystal mod uh, and do the language mod, um, if there are things you want to see and you're really, you know, you're really set on using composite video or compass shit video, as we say, uh, that's okay. I can do that video as well. Uh, just yell out in the comments and let me know. But for now, let's test this out for RGB. Okay, so I've just moved you over to my other TV, which is a CRT, and it, it accepts uh, RGB, as it says there on the screen. Um, so, sorry if it's a bit wobbly, but let's get on with it. I've got the same game in. I've got an RGB SCART cable coming in. It's the stereo patch one that plugs into the front headphone socket, so that's really handy. Um, this cable is from Retro Gaming Cables in the UK. Um, highly recommend picking up these particular SCAR cables because they're very high quality. I'll post a link to that in the description um, so you can check them out. Let's make sure in 50, so towards the black wire, the ground wire, turn it on um, and there you go. So the TV's running you can see all my crap in the background. <laughs> so the TV is running in 50, um, just as it was. Let's just wait for it to start up. You can still see the borders, even though this is a CRT TV, you can still see borders. It behaves exactly the same. Um, it's a little bit hard to film CRT. So if this flickers at all, you might see some uh, rolling vertical lines like this, or some uh, wavy things. It's just the CRT and the camera. Don't worry about that. So I'm gonna flick this now into 60 Hertz as it's running and listen to the music. That's the real telltale sign. Okay, so the music went a lot quicker. The game's faster. Our borders have disappeared. 
and we're now running RGB, grey colour, unaffected by the crystal, in 60 hertz on a PAL console. You should really have a go at it if you have any desire to do this. It's very easy and, uh, you know, it's a great result. Once you've started playing consoles in 60 hertz, you never really go back to 50. Um, American guys don't really know what it was like to experience 50, but yeah, we got we grew up with that, got used to it, and we're so glad we can mod now to 60. It's just a much better solution. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'll, I'll mount the switch next, and then we'll put it all back together. So let me just go back to the desk, and we'll keep going. Okay, so this for this final part of the video where we do the physical switch mount, um, you're going to need a drill bit. Uh, I like to use about a six millimeter on this particular switch. Uh, you know, you just sort of eyeball it. Um, go a little bit larger than, than the actual switch size because you don't want it super tight. You want a little bit of tolerance. Uh, and we have to extend that hole sideways so the switch can slide. So I've also got a nice little round uh, file here. So get yourself one of those. Um, and ha it's handy that it's about the same size. That's really handy. Uh, and then you're gonna need a drill, of course. So uh, mount your drill, lock it in, and get ready to drill. So the physical position, uh, look, you know, anywhere sort of here, directly opposite these metal tabs is fine. Uh, it's really a personal preference thing. Just remember the side of the case looks like that. So you can really put this wherever you want. Um, right here, and straight underneath that area there, that's a really good spot. It looks pretty good, but um, so does right here. So it doesn't really matter. Whatever you think looks right. I'm just gonna put mine around about there because that's where the wire comes out. Now I would recommend or highly recommend at this stage to remove the board out of the case um, and do this with no risk of damage to the board because if you slip with the drill and you drill into the board, you're gonna cause all sorts of problems. I've done this many, many times, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it, and I'll clean up the plastic uh, underneath. But I'd recommend you take the board out. And to do that, you take out uh, the further three screws here, you take out the cart slot screws, uh, lift out the power and headphone out of the way, and the board will just lift out. Uh, but for me, I'm a bit of a maverick. I've done this many times, so we're gonna mount it about here, try and get it centered up. And just go slow, that's the probably the key to this. Go nice and slow, and then when, you t when it starts to go through, really slow your speed down. And there it is. It went through, didn't touch anything. Job's done. <clears throat> so most of the mess as well comes on the comes outside of the case. So when you drill it from the outside, you don't really produce much mess at all. Now the only thing we've got to sort of do now is extend the hole uh, because that'll naturally sit like that. But we need the switch to slide, so we now need to drill next to it. So I'm just gonna do one more hole right next to it and then smooth it all out with the file and I'll show you the finished result. Okay, and when that's all done, you should end up with a result something like this. I'll zoom in for you. Now the switch will just sit in there nicely and it's got room to you know rock back and forth. So um, you can take your time and make that hole as neat and as tidy as you can. Um, but yeah, look, just uh, it's your console, so don't cut don't cut the hole if you don't want to. But uh, in this case, uh, the customer requested a, a mechanical switch, so that's what I've done. You know, other ways to do this without using a physical switch would, of course, be a switchless mod, uh, which control which is which uses a pick little pick IC uh, to control the logic. Um, won't get further into that, but if you did want to do this without a physical switch. Do a quick Google for PIC 
um, switchless mod and you'll come across uh, some other sites that have done it before. I've actually made a video on that with the Super Nintendo, uh, you know, the Super Famicom. So you can check out my video on that. Uh, you can see, I'll put a card up here. You can see that video and how I did it. Uh, and they're all pretty much the same how they operate. So keep that in mind if you didn't want to cut holes. So that's it guys. Uh, to mount the switch further, you could put screws through the holes, but I find super gluing it in behind um, completely fine. Um, you could use hot glue as well on that switch, I guess. Um, let me just do that now and I'll show the result. Uh, I, think, I think super glue in this case will be fine. So I'm just gonna use some basically some Selly's quick fix super glue. Uh, but before you glue it down, just remember you've touched all this area with your fingers and got fingerprints all over it, which isn't going to help the glue stick. So just get some isopropyl alcohol, as you normally do, a, a bit of a cotton bud, and just quickly clean the switch face that's going to be glued and the back of the plastic that's going to be glued. Get all that nice and clean, uh, and that'll evaporate in no time at all, just a, about 30 seconds to a minute and then you're okay to go. Okay, so that switch has had a, about 10 minutes to fully dry now, and that is rock solid. So, you know, just a bit of super glue is pretty good. That's it, we're pretty much done now. So we'll reassemble uh, and we'll test it one more time. Uh, then just reinsert your tray, making sure your LED doesn't get tangled up. Like mine just did, sit it in, Make sure your wire down there isn't pinched. It just sits nicely out of the way of the shield and you're good to go. Uh, it's these little black ones that went back in. So I'll just go ahead and put all those in. Um, we'll put the case on, I'll screw it all together and, and I'll show you the finished result. Okay, so that's all done. It's all put back together and everything's working. Um, the last thing I like to do is give the console a bit of a condition with the microfiber cloth, uh, just a nice soft one, and some automotive uh, plastic and sort of, you know, rejuvenation sort of spray. Um, sometimes I use Armor All, sometimes I use this stuff, uh, but a bit of a spray and wipe the whole console down. And that's the finished result. It comes off looking almost brand new um, and yeah, just gives it a nice protected coating. So that's it for today, guys. Quick video, quick run through of the 50, 60 hertz mod for the Mega Drive. And that's it. I hope you learned something. I hope it was interesting. If you want to see me do any other mods, post a comment down below and uh, below this video and I'll take a look. I like to reply to as many comments as possible. So I'm always on the lookout. All right, guys, take it easy. I'll see you next time. Bye.